a neuronic ah, pre-capitalist past um, of giant lizards pulsating heat and dreamlike surrealist regression. The glowing silt banks are described by Karans uh, suffering the delusional waverings of a fever as being like the lost but forever beckoning and unattainable shores of the amnionic paradise. Their warm, pellucid depths draw him both downwards as well as backwards into some kind of gestational totality, the will to annihilate the subject in the only biological way we might imagine, returning us to our originary zygotic creation at life's fetal beginnings with its mammalian cocoon of amniotic security, or in the other direction, hastening our passage towards the subjective annihilation of death, what Jean-Luc Nancy calls death's signature of the with. Lashed by rain, exposed to sun, dehydrated and vacillating dangerously between lucidity, lucidity and hallucination, Karan staggers towards his final descent into the phantasmagoric forest at the end of the novel. That he had traveled over 150 miles southward, Karen's could tell from the marked rise in temperature. Again, the heat had become all pervading, rising to 140 degrees, that's 60 degrees Celsius, not far off perhaps from the 48 degrees that we've seen recently in British Columbia. And he felt reluctant to leave the lagoon with its empty beaches and quiet ring of jungle. For some reason, he knew that Hardman would soon die and that his own life might not long survive the massive unbroken jungles to the south. Half asleep, he lay back thinking of the events the past years that had culminated in their arrival at the central lagoons and launched him upon his neuronic odyssey. At last, he tried the crutch to his leg again and with the butt of the empty 45, scratched on the wall below the window, sure that no one would ever read the message, 27th day have rested and are moving south, all is well, Kerans. So he left the lagoon and entered the jungle again, within a few days was completely lost, following the lagoon southward through the increasing rain and heat, attacked by alligators and giant bats, a second Adam searching for the forgotten paradises of the reborn sun. It might be one of Ballard's stilted symbolic leitmotifs, Throughout his early fiction, we see lean, rational, middle-class men become increasingly dishevelled. Doctors, architects, journalists and academics who wander into shimmering delirium when confronted with the irrepressible forces of entropic decline and devolutionary societal descent. Karams and Strangman in The Drowned World, Dr Edward Sanders and Ventress in The Crystal World, Robert Lang, Wilder and Anthony Royal in High Rise, Robert Maitland in Concrete Island, Dr. Charles Ransom and Richard Foster Lomax in The Drought. Ballard returns again and again to the image of these dispossessed Adamic figures searching for their own personal eschatological moment through a series of hostile landscapes. These figures invariably surrender to the seductive pull of their psychic inner space and the lurid and strange contours of their schizophrenic inner worlds comes to replace the environment that surrounds them. As one critic puts it in these novels, Ballard pointedly registers the loss of the human in his protagonists without humanist hand-wringing. These disaster novels, in other words, are not cast as dystopian novels with their typical mourning of loss. They are rather novels of adaptation to environment beyond the good and evil of a human um, value system. Ransom's attitude here and his desire to give himself up to the landscape, to become absorbed by it, even destroyed by it, conveys a distinctly anti-humanist strain that Ballard explores throughout his early 1960s disaster fictions. I'm reminded of it in Jeff Vandermeer's Southern Reach trilogy from 2014, in the terrifying beauty and desolation of Area X, which exerts an irresistible gravitational pull towards self-destruction for the biologist who disappears into the monstrous landscape, having left behind a note that says, quote, to remain human somehow seems pathetic. Written at two key historical moments that mark the emergence and subsequent amplification of eco-catastrophe narratives, that is in the early 1960s when Ballard published the Disaster Quartet and later in the mid 2010s when Vandermeer has been writing. 
I think these texts reveal the imbrication of human subjects within threatening and environmentally ravaged apocalyptic landscapes. Eco-catastrophe narratives are fundamentally involved then in a post-humanist critique of anthropocentric thinking. In ecological dystopias, as Rudolphus T. Wen puts it, the end of the world is near and human beings need to be taught humility in order to prevent the collapse of the planet. This humility requires human beings to see themselves in a wider context of beings, animal, vegetable and mineral, uh, sharing our planet. But is narrative the most appropriate form for building this kind of humility, I wonder? In Eco-Criticism on the Edge, Timothy Clarke asks whether fiction is even capable of apprehending the non-human scale of geological and ecological duration required to grasp the Anthropocene in its proper context of climatological change over tens of thousands of years. As he writes, the still dominant conventions of plotting, characterization and setting in the novel need to be openly acknowledged as pervaded by anthropocentric delusion. That our survival as a species is called into question is now in no doubt, as we reach the environmental and climatological tipping point of a sixth mass extinction event. Reading Jeff Vandermeer's blockbuster trilogy, and here I've shown you the Spanish edition with Pablo Declan's stunning cover art, which I think is the best of all the cover art for that trilogy. Um, reading it in light of Ballard's earlier eco-catastrophe texts, in which actually there's only one um, catastrophe in the drought, the desertification, which is actually caused by anthropogenic climate change. I think offers an interesting periodization for what I'm going to call hypnotic inhumanism. In these eco-disaster narratives, protagonists are drawn inexorably towards those forces that will destroy them. Forces that are ambivalently shown to be rich in aesthetic resources, inducing an awe-inspiring reverence that transmutes this romantic sublime into something darker, more eco-gothic. Dark ecology, plant horror, the monstrous vegetal, the Lovecraftian oat weird and the claustrophobic uncanny of primeval caves and cave dwelling is the context for what I'm going to sketch out today in sifting through this curious anti-humanism for clues as to its ontological potential. I want to argue that these weird, often surreal images of human characters surrendering themselves to particular environments, desiring to become part of the organic and inorganic worlds that will destroy them and thereby obliterating their own pathetic anthropocentrism, can, when read in a particular way, secrete glimpses of the kind of utopian post-humanism that we desperately need in this time on this planet. So first then, a word or two about utopia and inhumanism. It might seem perverse to assert that the inhuman could possibly be utopian. Thomas More's virtuous commonwealth, after all, is an object lesson in Erasmian humanism. As universal intellectuals, humanists such as Erasmus and More spoke, as one scholar puts it, on behalf of a not yet existent Christian and humanist commonwealth, and thereby forged an autonomous a social discursive space which human reality could be examined and reinvented, a social world made by humans for humans rather than any transcendent or metaphysical realm. But there is in fact a post-humanist strain in utopian philosophy that remains to the best of my knowledge entirely overlooked in post-humanist thinking and almost entirely ignored in contemporary utopian studies as well. I take my cue here from the German utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch and his little known theorization of natural futurity in the late text Tübinger Einleitung in die Philosophie from 1963, which was translated as the philosophy of the future in 1970. In a chapter titled Indications of Utopian Content, Bloch writes that the humanum has a wide range and cannot be restricted to anthropology pure and simple. Dismantling the progressivist notion of linear historical time and its sequence of civilizational stages Bloch argues that we perpetuate our own alienation um, in the sense that Marx outlines in the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. By divorcing historical from natural time, ascribing density only to the human activities of recorded history occludes a richer temporal sweep of natural, geological and environmental processes of which humans are a part. 
If there is only time where something is happening, he asks, what if very little happens or the something happens only with incredible slowness? Is the slow millennial murmuring of leaves in the breeze or water coursing seawards really only longer or just as dense as one bare Russian 1917? And I think I've got the quote. Yeah, here we go. So here's another one for you. He says, all these questions must be taken in a purely objective sense, not as questions solely about the time of human experience beyond the geological millennia. All epochs, not only those which are humanly historical, have to be comprehended in relation to the differentiations in the density of historical and material occurrence of its tendencies and contents. And whilst it's true to say that Bloch's provocation does remain grounded within a fundamentally Marxist and humanist project, um, by which I mean he seeks to extend the boundaries of the human to encompass the vaster array of cosmological activity, so that then the anthropocentrically framed subject might finally feel at home in the world. I think his insistence that we understand pre-human nature as enacting its own agentive density unfolding in its own glacial time and remaining pregnant with its own futurity beyond the human, actually offers a radical thought experiment in the vein of recent theoretical contributions to the new materialisms and post-humanist theory, particularly ecological or environmental post-humanism. Liberating the utopian impulse from its Maurian humanist origins then allows us to focus our critical attention on the relationship between post-humanism and subjectivity uncovering utopian spuren traces in those aesthetic forms and narrative styles that offer us a glimpse of something beyond the cage of subjective experience, whether intersubjective, distributed among numerous subjects, proto-collective or beyond human understanding altogether. We might read in Bloch's ideas about natural historical time and natural futurity, a gesture of incipient post-humanism that can help us uncover this post-anthropocentric structure of feeling. And whilst this might be a post-humanist endeavor, it need not be an anti-humanist one. As Rosie Bredotti teaches us, post-humanist thinking releases the human subject into an expanded affective and ontological realm of connectedness, mutual affordances and relationality. Patricia McCormack makes a similar point in her use of the term in, uh, sorry, a human as set out in the fiery introduction to her 2020 book, The A Human Manifesto, and I quote, this manifesto may seem to hate humans. It does not. It simply sees different trajectories to the more typical political academic human versus human arguments. It is a manifesto of joy, but the joy is for all life, not only ours. It is a manifesto that repudiates hierarchy, that refuses some human rights should be privileged over others, and that human rights should be privileged over non-human." End quote. So to be a human is not the same thing as to be anti-human, and to be inhuman, as we will come to see, could be something else altogether. Increasingly, everywhere I turn at the moment, looking across scholarly and para-academic literature published uh, within and around the environmental humanities, this sentiment of joy for all life, not only ours, volleys around. I see it in Robert McFarlane's joyous, terrifying descent into the depths of limestone caves, ancient catacombs and sweltering rock salt mines. In Anna Lohenhaupt Singh's reverence for the Matsutake mushrooms that upend any and all epistemological and ontological categories. And in Merlin Sheldrake's rejoinder to look beyond the animal kingdom and uncover the mysterious, mind blowing, mycelial and fungal worlds beneath our feet. I see it too in Rachel Carson's insistence that the living ocean beneath our passenger ships is a rich topographical realm of biospheric diversity and Philip Hoare's poetic love songs to the sea. This joy is evident even in Geoffrey Jerome Cohen's Geophilia, where he describes stones as being, quote, rich in worlds, not ours, while we are poor in their duration. I'm interested in particular in the inorganic, uh, sorry, in the organic and non-organic life beyond the animal kingdom. And so what I'm going to describe sits adjacent to the fascinating field of critical animal studies, but doesn't really provide an intervention there. 
I've been collecting texts in literature, film, art, sculpture, and video installation that convey the different kinds of non-human agency theorized by scholars working in the new materialist turn. I'm thinking here of people like Donna Haraway, Rosie Bredotti, Stacey Alimo, Claire Colbrook, Patricia McCormack, Timothy Clark, Astrida Naimanis, Steve Mentz, and Melody Jew. And in so doing, they grapple with what Rob Nixon calls the long emergencies of slow violence. That is the representational dilemma of conveying slow moving attritional disasters that move in a different order of time, geological, glacial, hydrological. Timothy Morton has similarly written that global warming is like a very slow nuclear explosion that nobody even notices is happening. And in his 2015 work, Eco-Criticism on the Edge, the environmental humanities scholar, Timothy Clark, asks whether fiction is even capable of apprehending the non-human scale of geological and ecological duration. So what follows then is, um, if I can find my slide, my attempt to um, develop an elemental analysis that explores the non-human within texts that undo this narrative um, or novelistic sometimes anthropocentric delusion, as Clark has called it. Focusing in particular today on the lithic, the minerals and crystals, the aggregation into rock and stone. I'm going to examine how narratives that privilege the lithic reveal animated, lively, dynamic and agential non-human perspectives. And I think they yield a seductive, almost magnetic kind of hypnotic inhumanism, which encourages the protagonists of these eco-catastrophe fictions, but also us, the readers, to willingly entertain our own destruction in search of a connectedness or an entanglement with the inorganic environment. So let's go back to Ballard for a closer look uh, to think about this idea of hypnotic inhumanism. The fourth novel in Ballard's Disaster Quartet, The Crystal World, published in 1966, opens with a typically uneasy spectral Ballardian image as Dr. Edward Sanders steps off the passenger deck of a packet boat traveling from Libreville to Port Matar, a fictional settlement on the edge of the Cameroonian jungle near a quarry. Gleaming across the dark swells of the river, the port looms like the pavilion of an abandoned necropolis. The novel explicitly references an abortive military coup 10 years earlier that's left traces on the landscape, focused on possession of the emerald and diamond mines nearby. As Jeanette Baxter argues in her post-colonial analysis of the novel, Ballard's intertextual references here include Kurtz's voyage up the River Congo in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, um, but also Arnold Buckland's symbolist nightmarish painting, The Isle of the Dead from 1880 which looks across the black waters of the River Styx, as well as referencing, um, and sorry, the, the novel also references real historical events such as the Katanga Revolt in the early 1960s in Cameroon. Layering real as well as fictional settings, Baxter suggests that Ballard achieves the prose equivalent of Max Ernst's, Ernst's <laughs> that's really hard to say, Max Ernst's textured technique of the paper over wooden floorboards to reveal in works such as the entire city what art historians describe to be an enigmatic grain that looks like mysterious forests peopled with bird-like creatures. The mystery at work in the crystal world is a process of crystallization that is spreading like a virus throughout the jungle infecting plants, trees, animals and any people who come into contact with it. This illuminated forest, Sanders writes in a letter, in some way reflects an earlier period of our lives, perhaps an archaic memory we are born with of some ancestral paradise where the unity of time and space is the signature of every leaf and flower. As he travels into the forest interior, attempting to reach a leper hospital, um, and weirdly the plot hinges around trying to rekindle a former sexual liaison with one of the doctors who runs the leper colony, um, but I'm not gonna go into that as fascinating as it is. Sanders enters a world where the normal laws of the physical universe were suspended. Advancing in animated waves like a heavy frost and petrifying everything in its path, he circumnavigates a frontier of vitrified crocodiles transported into translucent mineral brilliance, glacé ferns and houses described as glistening like wedding cakes, 
their white roofs and chimneys transformed into exotic minarets and Baroque domes. In one memorable scene, a man becomes a tree. Uh, quote, part of the head and shoulder and the entire length of the right arm had annealed themselves to the crystal outgrowths from the base of the oak, end quote. The beauty of the destruction is heavily underscored. Quote again, on a lawn of green glass spurs, a child's tricycle glittered like a Fabergé gem, the wheels starred into brilliant jasper crowns. The crystallization process is referred to both as vitrification, turning something into glass, and also petrification, turning something into stone. I'll come back to that in a minute. And it kills all organic life that enters its orbit, but it also preserves men, animals, and vegetation. Like the human remains at Pompeii, these forms are captured in instantaneous moments of activity. Or like the photographic image that Roland Barthes describes in Camera Lucida as a segment of arrested frozen time, the image of a window, as Eve Lomax puts it, that can easily also be seen as a sheet of ice, a fluid that has become a solid and which has to a greater or lesser degree transparency. That's her description of Barthes um, image of the photograph. There's an odd commingling of technological rationality with its medico-scientific gaze and the re-sacralized contours of an enchanted world that is repeatedly described in religious terms, cathedral-like, sepulchral, effulgent, anticipating the new Jerusalem. And this combination of the modern and the pre-modern is presented within the context of the French and Belgian colonial Congo through references to conquistadors and military conquest. The first crystallized victim that Sanders inspects uh, is described in the following terms. From the elbow to the fingertips, the man's right arm was enclosed by, or more precisely, had effloresced into a mass of translucent crystals, through which the prismatic outlines of the hand and fingers could be seen in a dozen multicolored reflections. This huge jeweled gauntlet, like the coronation armor of a Spanish conquistador, was drying in the sun, its crystals beginning to emit a hard, vivid light. Elsewhere, references to El Dorado reveal the slippage between early conquistador myths of the golden tribal chief and the term's later usages to signify a kingdom of riches. As the boat operator says, quote, El Dorado, the man of gold and jewels in an armor of diamonds, there's an end many would wish for, doctor. Drawing on Anne McClintock's reading of the significance of London's Crystal Palace at the Great Exhibition in 1851, Jeanette Baxter suggests that this crystal light, which Ballard's magic lantern projects, uh, appears to bathe the post-colonial landscape with a magical and restorative light that transforms the pale African geography into a brilliant palimpsest of colors. McClintock notes that the Crystal Palace housed the first consumer dreams of a unified world time presenting a mass spectacle of the linear time of European industrial progress that embodied the hope that all the world's cultures would be gathered under one roof, allowing visitors to consume history voyeuristically as spectacle as they perambulated the dioramas and panoramas narrating the process of empire and its conquest over natural history. And that's in um, Anne McClintock's uh, 1991 book, Imperial Leather. Like Bentham's Panopticon, the exhibition was organized by the structuring principle of perpetual surveillance refracted through the pellucid architectural innovation of the Crystal Palace itself. So let's see how this voyeuristic colonial gaze, this crystallized aesthetic is presented, but also deconstructed in the crystal world. It has something to do with the great exhibition's unification of global capitalist time as Anne McClintock explores, I think. The crystallization process is then compared with the crystalline structures of viral infections and not to be forgotten, this novel is centrally concerned with a leper colony, so you can also consider it to be a plague narrative. And the lepers are described as being immune to time. Despite the fact that the crystallization affects human and vegetative um, life, Ballard presents the encroaching crystallization in organic terms, so it gradually becomes synonymous with the jungle. Um, but it's also worth mentioning that the crystallization in a kind of info dump backstory has come from outer space and arrived on Earth uh, from elsewhere in the solar system. 
And I think this suggests what we might call the novel's eco-Gothic strain, although this term wasn't obviously in usage when Ballard was writing. Drawing on pervasive cultural anxieties about forests and their forbidding interiors to subvert the reader's expectation by presenting an arboreal realm that promises vitrification and death, and yet also embalms its victims in a resplendent light that hints both at messianic revelation as well as enlightenment knowledge, clarity and illumination. There's something almost rejuvenating about the forest, Sanders breathlessly exclaims to Ventress, to which Ventress enigmatically replies, we've all been here before, Doctor. It facilitates yet yeah, then the Jungian regression that we've seen in the drowned world. Um, and here is a quote towards the, uh, the center of the novel. The beauty of the spectacle had turned the keys of memory and a thousand images of childhood forgotten for nearly 40 years filled his mind recalling the paradisal world when everything seemed illuminated by that prismatic light described so exactly by Wordsworth in his recollections of, recollections of childhood that the magical shore in front of him seemed to glow like that brief spring. The reference to Wordsworth's preludes here recalls what Jonathan Bate called the geological sublime's influence on romantic ecology. And this, I think, is where our crystallised aesthetic begins to sharpen into focus under the valence of a new materialist analysis. The clue here is the connection between vitrification turning into glass and petrification turning into stone. With its jewelled vegetation, vitrified river and carb carboniferous crust, the crystallised forest in Ballard's novel is repeatedly referred to as petrified, as having turned not just into glass, but into stone. And I think this is more than a mere etymological slippage, and it hints at the novel's productive engagement with what environmental scholars term inhumanism. Although there's quite a lot of disagreement about what that term means, um, so you have to be careful who, who you choose, I guess, to follow. As a non-organic component of the non-human world, rock has a primitive materiality that connects us with ancient prehistorical timescales that far exceed human comprehension. As Noah Herringman explains in a book on Romanticism's fascination with the lithic from 2004, rock remains the most intractable substance of nature considered as a human environment, one in which both subjugated and wild domains can appear as resources. The value of wilderness as an aesthetic resource explains the continued striving after terror or some version of it by enlightened improvers, poets and theorists alike over a period of many decades. The loss of rational control or subjectivity entailed by this terror is always to some degree a ritual enactment of the real impossibility of ultimate control over nature. And in addition to the crystallization process being referred to as vitrification in the crystal world, we can identify another textual clue that suggests the significance of rock to understanding Ballard's hypnotic inhumanism in his earlier 1965 eco-catastrophe, The Drought, which was published just one year earlier. In The Drought, Dr. Charles Ransom treasures um, a limestone paperweight, one of a handful of personal items that furnish his houseboat like the cargo of some psychic ark. From chalk cliffs with a child, Ransom's homemade limestone paperweight contains, quote, fossil shells embedded in its surface, bearing um, a quantum of Jurassic time, like a jewel, end quote. As Robert McFarlane writes in his 2019 book, Underland, limestone is formed from the calcium carbonate skeletons and shells of ancient marine organisms compressed through the millennia, uh, quote, in this way, he says, limestone can be seen as merely one phase in a dynamic earth cycle, whereby mineral becomes animal, becomes rock. Rock that will in time, deep time, eventually supply the calcium carbonate out of which new organisms will build their bodies, thereby re-nourishing the same cycle into being again. When viewed in deep time, he says, things come alive that seemed inert. Deep time is kept by stone, ice, stalactites, seabed sediments and the drift of tectonic plates. Deep time opens into the future as well as the past. As Aidan Tynan has argued, Ballard um, influenced the American artist Robert Smithson and both men shared a weird fascination with crystals. 
Like Ballard, um, Smithson then used experimental landscapes to pursue new forms of space and time in ways that collapse distinctions between organic and inorganic. His 1970 land art piece, Spiral Jetty, is a spiral strip of black basalt on the Great Salt Lake in Utah, which Smithson describes as drawing the viewer's attention to the lake's Devonian industry and remnants of Silurian technology. Uh, quote, the mere sight of the trapped fragments of junk and waste transported one into a world of modern prehistory. All the machines of the upper Carboniferous period were lost in those expansive deposits of sand and mud. That's Smithson. So like Ballard's psychic temporality in the drowned world with its oversized Triassic plant life and pulsing reptilian temporality, Smithson's land art returns time and again to the properties of the mineralogical and of crystal in particular, to convey entropic landscapes characterized by inorganic rocks and compounds rather than organic plant life, pregnant with the decay and desiccation of deep geological time. There's a utopian strain to this elemental approach. Jeffrey Jerome Cohen and Lowell Duckett call it elemental eco-criticism. The less human the collective, they write, the more humane it may become. And by less human, we do not mean the world without us, but a disanthropocentric re-envisioning of the complicated biomes and cosmopolo God, that's another hard word. cosmopolity, sorry, within which we dwell. When Sanders voluntarily returns to the crystallized forest at the end of the crystal world, in an attempt to recover the missing fragments of himself living on in their own prismatic medium, we might read his decision to embrace death via the self-immolation of vitrifying, petrifying crystallization as an incipient gesture of dis or post-anthropocentric solidarity, inhuman and yet, according to this definition, perversely more humane. Inhuman agency, as Cohen writes, undermines our fantasies of sovereign relation to environment, a domination that renders nature out there a resource for recreation, consumption and exploitation. This idea of an elemental approach to rethinking human non-human relations beyond reductive nature culture binaries and beyond even in fact species boundaries um, is at the heart of these fictional but also theoretical interventions into the question of human survival in the Anthropocene and particularly of note are theoretical contributions within feminist, queer, post-colonial and new materialist theory. In her 2018 book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, the professor of inhuman geography, she got to choose a great job title there, Catherine Yusuf argues that the field of geology in which the periodizing geological idea of the Anthropocene originates is inseparable from colonialism and the privileging of whiteness. As she demonstrates, the universalizing logic of geology is not politically neutral. We might assume that as an earth science dedicated to the study of the material earth or to any other terrestrial planet or satellite, its rocks, strata, evolutionary history and environmental history, that the discipline of geology is objective, empirical, based on physical facts and their relations outside of the sphere of human political culture. However, as she writes, um, and the quote is up here for you, in the transformation of the mineralogy of the earth in the extraction of gold, silver, salt and copper to the massive transformation of ecologies in the movement of people, plants and animals across territories, coupled with the intensive implantation of monocultures of indigo, sugar, tobacco, cotton and other alien ecologies in the new world. The complex histories of those afterlives of slavery continued in the chain gangs that laid the railroad and worked the coal mines through to the establishment of new forms of energy in which, as Stephanie Le Menager comments, oil was literally conceived as a replacement for slave labor. And there's a concept of black oil that petroculture scholars um, refer to. Black gold as well. The materials that geology studies, subterranean rocks, metals, and the stored energy of carbon deposited in fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and gas, are therefore intrinsically connected to human activity through extraction and extractivism. 
and thereby also connected to the social organization of labor through history. And this organization, as we know, is conducted along violent lines of slavery and indenture. And what's particularly relevant for geology, as Catherine Yusof shows, is that the inhuman properties ascribed to geological materials like rock, stone, minerals and metals are also forced upon the slave labor that was essential to the mining of these materials that accompanied their transportation and was a part of a system of exchange in which materials were bought and sold as part of the transatlantic slave trade between the 16th and 18th centuries. Her project in the billion black Anthropocenes or none challenges the racial blindness of the Anthropocene by demonstrating how the empirical study of geology is itself founded on historical geological relations where classificatory systems identified value in particular subterranean materials and assumed property rights over these materials. And in so doing, they dispossessed indigenous communities while subjugating them into a position of inhumanity in which people were reduced to the status of commodities to be bought and sold in a global capitalist network of exchange. Geology's whiteness, as she suggests, is at the same time an expression of anti-blackness. It is so entrenched within the discipline that it usually goes unnoticed. The white utopia of industrial progress, as the Jamaican novelist and critic Sylvia Winter puts it, was a black inferno. So the fossil objects of geological study then are inseparable from racial logics of extraction and environmental harm, as well as a classificatory system that divided human agents from inhuman material or matter. Turning to the more apocalyptic, dystopian and eco-catastrophic implications of the Anthropocene, uh, Yusuf notes then that this might seem to offer a dystopian future that laments the end of the world, but imperialism and ongoing settler colonialisms have been ending worlds for as long as they have been in existence. Uh, and here's the kind of crucial bit, I think, of her argument. The proximity of black and brown bodies to harm in this intimacy with the inhuman is what I'm calling black Anthropocenes. It is an inhuman proximity organized by historical geographies of extraction, grammars of geology, imperial global geographies, and contemporary environmental racism. It is predicated on the presumed absorbent qualities of black and brown bodies to take up the body burdens of exposure to toxicities and to buffer the violence of the earth, literally stretching black and brown bodies across the seismic, seismic fault lines of the earth, black Anthropocene subtend white geology as a material stratum. Anticipating an apocalypse in the near future might then be said to be a white anxiety, since the apocalypse has already happened for African Americans. Indeed, it has been happening and ongoing for centuries. In N.K. Jemison's multi-award winning fantasy trilogy, The Broken Earth, this idea that the disaster has already happened and apocalyptic survival remains an ongoing ontological condition is developed in a really intriguing way. This world is in many respects as brutal a place as the charred ash covered hellscape of Cormac McCarthy's extinction narrative, The Road, or the terrifying near future California of Octavia Butler's Earthseed books with its plague of drug induced pyromania and everyday traumas of rape, murder, human slavery and religious fanaticism. Jemison's fantasy world presents extreme challenges to the survival of a declining human population that has endured a desperate cycle of apocalyptic seasons for thousands of years. And each season is described as having its own um, eco-catastrophe, um, including a terrible volcano and subsequent decades of ash clouds, a series of tsunamis that render entire coastal areas uninhabitable, or the current um, uh, list of earthquakes that are ongoing. And the cycle was initially triggered, according to legend, by Father Earth's anger at humanity. In this world, the Earth is alive, sentient and vengeful, intent on destroying humanity, described as the hateful waiting planet beneath their feet, a planet that wants nothing more than to destroy the life infesting its once pristine surface. Elsewhere, I've called it Arcadian revenge, and it brings to life the revenge fantasies of an earlier generation of biocentrist deep ecology in which taken to its extreme, 
James Lovelock's Gaia principle could be used to justify the extinction of those species that cause untold suffering for other species. The whole of life, Gaia itself then, might benefit by the removal of certain of its constituent parts, by which the deep ecologists mean the hum humans. So how is stone significant here? Well, the current apocalyptic season has left the planet subject to frequent tectonic shifts, catastrophic earthquakes and volcanic eruptions have shrunk habitable human communities to an equatorial stretch known as the stillness. Some of the human population are born with an ability to manipulate seismic activity, and these characters are known as origins and are brutally exploited. This exploitation includes um, the routine murder of young origin babies and children, even at the hands of their own families being sold into a state sanctioned system of academies where their seismic powers can be honed and harnessed to help quell earthquakes and ensure the safety of remaining human settlements. But most brutal of all, the practice of placing comatose origin children in a seismic network to function as living nodes within a system of protection that causes them untold suffering. In the first novel, The Fifth Season, um, Jemison's black protagonist, uh, spoiler alert, I'm just gonna reveal the important part about this text, uh, appears in three different characters, Essen, Demaya, and Cyanite. Um, a monstrous young girl in the first part whose magical 